Hello and welcome to our video interview today. Today we are at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge. We are talking with Peter Campbell about identifying the preventable causes of cancer. Thank you for joining us, Peter. So, what sparked your interest in cancer genetics? I started life as a clinician. In fact, I, um, I was a haematologist treating patients with uh, leukemias and lymphomas. It became, you know, as, as I was doing the, the clinical work, I was reading up more about the diseases, it became clear to me that the biological underpinnings of those, of those diseases were, were genetic. These were somatic mutations that were driving the, the pathogenesis of these leukemias. And I became interested in all of the leukemias and lymphomas for which we didn't have a genetic explanation. I, was, uh, I became interested in tumours other than blood cancers. In fact, now it seems that I've yet to find a tumour that isn't interesting. You're a joint head of the Cancer Genome Project. Can you tell us about your team and the work you are currently conducting? I guess for the last five, ten years or so, we've been um, within the Sanger Institute using uh, high throughput, um, large scale gene sequencing studies to try and discover the genetic architecture of, of human cancers. Most of that work has been uh, recently driven by vast improvements in the underlying techniques for genome sequencing and the fact that now we can we can sequence an entire cancer genome. What that means is that suddenly from you know when I started my research training to now the genome has moved from something that was basically infinite to something that's finite and something that's knowable and uh, so the the work that we do has been really to kind of drill down and, and describe all of the different types of, of changes that one sees in, in cancer genomes. Fundamentally, I guess there are three main pieces of information that one gets from sequencing a cancer genome. The first is which genes are involved in driving the biology of that particular person's cancer. Um, the second is what are the processes, the mutational processes that have been active during the evolution of that cancer to cause those mutations in the first place. And the third piece of information we get is how did the cancer get from a normal cell to a cancer cell? What steps did it take in what order and, and what were the kind of false starts that it made as it, as it sort of searched around trying to find the perfect uh, cancer genome? You are the co-investigator on the grand challenge looking at identifying the preventable causes of cancer. Could you tell us a bit about the aims of this project? We've known for some time that there's, there's a huge amount of variation across the world in the incidences of certain cancers. Um, in, in, for example, where I grew up um, in New Zealand, the, there's a very high rate of, a, of melanoma, a particular type of skin cancer, much higher than, than incidences, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, similarly, there's a, there's a cluster of, of uh, cancers of the esophagus in, in certain parts of Africa that can be 10 times higher than other countries. There are very high rates of gastric cancer in, in China, for example. We don't really understand why there are these variations in, um, in cancer incidents across the world, um, and it would certainly be nice to get an explanation for that. Probably the most plausible explanation for many of these clusters is that there are differences in the environment, diet or, um, or you know, local geography or um, particular lifestyle exp um, exposures, so on, that, that can drive these differences in incidence. It's quite likely that some of those differences in environment will read out in the cancer genome and the particular types of mutations that the cancers get. So, so for example, we know that, um, that if you sequence lung cancers from smokers compared to non-smokers, you can see a difference in the patterns of mutations that you see. Uh, in fact, you know, if you give me a, a lung cancer genome, I can tell you whether that person smoked or not. And, um, and it's quite likely that um, that many of these different these geographical differences across the world could read out in in differences in the patterns of mutations um, that we see. So the the grand challenge really is is it is a grand challenge. It's to it's to uh, 
to take cancers from across the world, um, particularly where there are large geographical uh, differences in the incidence of those cancers, and to sequence them and see if there are differences in the patterns of mutation that we're seeing in regions that have very high rates of cancer compared to low rates of cancer. And if there are these differences, to try and identify what environmental factors might be driving those differences, with the ultimate aim really of, of identifying which of those environmental factors might be preventable. Thank you very much. This project is an international collaboration. Could you tell us about the advantages of conducting this project on an international level? Well, of course, the questions about uh, international differences in, in cancer incidence can only be answered really by going to the countries where you have very high incidences of cancer. Um, many of those countries don't have a particularly well-established cancer research infrastructure. Um, so, so many of the challenges that we're going to face are in, in working out how to work with those local communities to, um, to collect samples that, that can be analysed and, and also to work with the communities to understand the differences in lifestyles across these different um, these different countries and to work out how we can correlate the, the changes that we see in the cancer genome with the particular lifestyles that, that those, those um, different countries um, ad adopt. So, um, you know, in, in many of these things there'll be, there might be particular aspects of diet or so on that we don't know to ask about and they don't know to tell us about and so a lot of the, a lot of the challenges and the kind of the fun of the project will, will, will come in, in, in bringing, bringing those different communities the, together and, and trying to understand. In your opinion, how could mapping the process of early tumour development help us to prevent and detect cancer at an earlier stage? It, it's become clear as we've done many of these uh, cancer genome sequencing studies that, that cancers often follow preferred trajectories of evolution. There are particular genes that occur early in the development of cancer and then a, a wider repertoire of, of genes emerging late on in the development of cancer. Obviously from the point of view of early detection and early prevention, preventive therapies, one would like to know what the earliest changes are and to think about what the biological consequences of those earliest changes are. It seems from, from our very first studies in this, in this area that, that the first changes are not radically shifting the biology of the cell in many cases. You know, their function as normal cells even though they have you know, the first genetic change of, of cancer. It takes, still takes some years for them to get the second and then the third and fourth change on their, on their way towards cancer. So, so we have, in theory, quite a large window of opportunity after the cells take their first step before they really get to the final stages of, of cancer development. And so if we can understand what those genetic changes are and what they're doing to the cell and potentially identify vulnerabilities that those cells have acquired as a result of those first genetic changes, then we have a, a good window of opportunity in theory to intervene or to, um, to think about uh, cancer preventive type therapies. Thank you very much. Where do you think the field will be in the next five years? The field of cancer genomics, where we are at the moment is that we have characterized most of the common cancer genes in, in the common tumour types, a pretty decent smattering of, of the genes involved in rare cancer types. What we don't have is a sense really of the rarely mutated genes in, in common tumour types and there's certainly a mileage to be made in continuing to flesh out that catalogue of, of, of cancer genes um, in the common tumour types because there may well be therapeutic opportunities from some of those genetic changes. Similarly, we have a pretty good understanding now of, um, of what the mutational processes are that are active in cancers and we've got pretty good catalogues of those. They will continue to to crystallise over the next few years, um, but we really lack, for many of them, a, a, an actual understanding of what the underlying biology is. We can describe the mutational process or what, what it does to the genome, but we don't really understand how it's occurring, and so I think a lot of the work that we'll be doing over the next five years is to try and unpick that. Similarly, we have a reasonable handle on 
the principles by which cancers evolve, we understand it is a Darwinian evolutionary um, battle, a kind of competition between different somatic clones in a, in a kind of battle for survival, etc. Um, those principles have been well known for 20, 30 years. I think that that over the next five years we'll be, we'll be moving that understanding earlier and earlier in cancer development and understanding that the first changes. So I've you know, circled around the topic, where do I think we'll be in five years time? We'll certainly have better catalogues of, of cancer genes and uh, mutational processes and understanding of how they are originating. We'll understand the principles of cancer evolution. I think the next step for us is really to take that information and bring it back to the patient. So, so some of the work that we've been doing recently has been exploring how we can use this genetic information um, to predict what will happen to a patient when we treat them. So, so the idea is that you know the cancer is incredibly complex. There is lots of variation between individuals in the patterns of genes that they have driving their cancer. That information definitely relates to the clinical features of the condition. So we, we, can, we can use that information to predict how nasty or how benign someone's cancer is. Uh, and therefore, ultimately, potentially, what kind of treatment would be best for that, for that person. And so I think a lot of the direction over the next few years will be to try and identify how we can use this information to better target um, treatments at, at patients. So secondly, I think that uh, a major direction for us will be to, will be to move the, uh, the understanding of cancer development much earlier in the process and understand the first changes um, with a view to working out how we can harness that information to better prevent or better detect cancers at a stage when they're, when they're treatable. Um, and those kind of studies, I think, will take a lot longer to come to fruition than, than the studies I was outlining earlier, uh, but, um, but they will potentially be quite transformative. Um, and, and thirdly, I think a major direction for us is to, um, uh, is to begin to think about the relationship between cancer and ageing. So we know that cancers show um, a dramatic increase in, in incidence later on in life um, and it suggests that, that ageing and cancer are kind of closely intertwined. Um, and we're kind of interested in, in how we can use genetic somatic mutations, um, sequencing of normal tissues to really understand the aging process and how that interfaces with, with cancer development. Thank you for that. That sounds really interesting. Do you have any parting thoughts for our viewers? So one of the challenges for, for cancer genome sequencing and so on is, is how we bring this to the clinic, how we can take uh, a patient who's coming in um, and bring the genome sequencing into their routine care in the same way that we look at the tumour down a microscope where they have some x-rays to see how far the cancer spread. We should be thinking about doing genome sequencing as as exactly the same way as part of the routine care for a patient with cancer. Unlike imaging and histology, which have been well ensconced in, in hospitals for, for many years, uh, genome sequencing is not currently um, in, um, part of, of that care, and we need to work out systems for bringing it in. The NHS has a, has a really uh, amazing opportunity to, to lead on this uh, because, um, because it has a a captive market of patients who, who are coming in who um, are expecting world-class uh, health care um, and there has been investment from the government in the form of Genomics England in uh, in bringing genomics to to clinical care uh, so one of the I think one of the exciting things that will happen over the next few years is is the is the laying the groundwork for uh, bringing uh, cancer genomics into into the NHS, and that promises a, a, a huge um, shift in the in the way that we that we diagnose and manage uh, cancers. Probably not. 
tomorrow, but, but certainly in five, ten years' time. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your time. If you'd like to see more videos like these and watch the rest of the videos in this series of the Sanger Institute, please subscribe below and register for Oncology Central. Please let us know your thoughts by commenting below. You can also tweet us at Oncology Central as well as Facebook, LinkedIn and Google+. Thank you for joining us again. See you soon.